Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Everyday Anarchism. I'm your host, Graham Colbertson, and this is, it should be, I truly believe it's going to be the last episode in my series on radicalism in the English Revolution. And in a strange uh, full circle moment, the first person I reached out to about this series more than a year ago was uh, an, an expert on radicalism and Gerard Wynn Stanley named Anne Hughes. And Anne was busy, couldn't appear on the show, pointed me to Ariel Hesseon, who pointed me to John Morrill and everyone else you have heard on this series. Bernard Cap. all of those people came from this conversation with Ariel, who was referred to me by Anne. And finally, 16 months later, Anne Hughes is on the podcast to talk to us about radicalism in the English Revolution. Anne, thank you for joining me. That's my pleasure, Graham. It's um, sorry it's taken so long, and I'm not sure you know what else I'll have to say. But I'm very glad to be <laughs> on it finally. <laughs> well, I mean, what what we're going to talk about, and I'll ask you to introduce yourself a little bit more in depth. But what we're going to talk about is this book, "The World Turned Upside Down," by Christopher Hill. And I didn't read this book before I started this series. I had it. I looked through it. I took mm -hmm. notes, but I didn't really go through it. And it turns out that almost everything I had received about the idea of the English Revolution had come from this book. I didn't realize that, but I, I, I know that now. So in some ways, we're beginning uh, at the end and ending at the beginning. It seems to me the English Revolution is sort of born with this book. But, uh, well, I should let you respond to that. But before, can yeah. you just tell us who you are and why, yeah. I'll, why I'll, you're I'll interested in the English about, Revolution? Yeah. I'm, um, I mean, I have worked on Gerald Wynn Stanley to my great benefit. i am uh, worked all my professional life on the mid-17th mid century England, which we call an English Civil War and many of us call an English Revolution. Um, I'm... Uh, when I'm a teacher, I always tell my students not to do the things they did in high school to try something different. I did this period when I was in high school, A level, <laughs> never moved away from it. Um, I've done a, my PhD was a local study of Warwickshire and the Civil War. I then wrote more generally about the causes of the Civil War and became part of a movement. I suppose we're called post revisionists. <laughs> or I call. I call myself an anti-revisionist, really, a group of us who um, didn't like revisionist scholarship that was critical, really, of Hill. And we're, um, I, I have to say, I work with Christopher Hill. I'm going to be perhaps less enthusiastic than some of you about some of his work, but obviously he's, a both, he's very influential and been very influential on me, certainly. And I've, after a local study, I did a book about the causes of the English Civil War, which I called it then. And then I've done, I don't believe in only studying people you agree with. So I did a book about a very nasty man, Thomas Edwards, the heresiographer, who's quoted a great deal in the world, turned upside down, trying to understand that book. And then more recently, or not that recently now, I've written on gender. I regard myself as a feminist and uh, a socialist indeed, but um, I've done a thing about gender, about women, about understanding manhood as well, and contested. Uh, and then I've done the edition of Win Stanley with literary colleagues. And I mean, we'll come back to this probably, but I, I think why I've been interested always in this period, I think it's profound political upheaval in a country that pretends it hasn't had many profound upheavals. Um, basic political, social, cultural matters were questioned. A lot of create, creative collective action by people who were not normally part of early modern hierarchies. And I just think it's a fantastically interesting, significant, important period that um, in, the, in our culture, we've not precisely forgotten about it, but we sort of glamorized it or underplayed it in very ways. So that's me, really. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a wonderful start. I already have many thoughts and tangents we can go on, but I'm going to skip that now and just speak to you. You've perfectly set this up by calling yourself a post-revisionist or an anti-revisionist. You're getting us into this concept called, I mean, historians call it, I understand, I, I believe historians call it, I'm not a historian, historiography. I, yeah. 
I haven't discussed this too much on the show. John Morrill is really the only one who I discussed this issue with, which makes sense that he being, I guess, the, the revisionist, revisionist is yes. the one who, <laughs> who wants to bring this up. Of course, yeah. I should also say, I mean, this is the historiography part. Surely Christopher Hill is the revisionist when this book comes out. I mean, that's how historiography works. You don't have this inert past sitting there. You You have the 17th century that was received in the 1940s, and then you have the 17th century that was received in the yeah. 60s. And that 60s was a revisionist to the 40s, presumably, and we just keep re- revising to that. Yeah. Did that I mean, get us there? <laughs> yeah, I think the world turned upside down is certainly um, a revisionist work within what you might call the Marxist or left-wing tradition about mm. the English Civil War. And I don't know if you've covered this in the podcast before, stop me, but um, I suppose that there was, um, there has been a whole tradition about the the English Civil War, the revolution, as an, as an important turning point um, in British, perhaps Western history. Part, sometimes in a sort of liberal tradition that it's about liberty and religious toleration. It's also been very important in Marxist traditions. Uh, and the classic, I mean, it's complicated because even within this tradition, there were many serious debates. But around in that tradition, the English Civil War is seen as a bourgeois revolution. It's a, it's a, I mean, this is very simple, but it's, it's, and when I say there's different ways in which it's expressed, that it's a revolution perhaps brought about by emerging capitalist groups, but certainly a revolution that um, facilitates the rise of capitalism and, you know, modern sort of bourgeois um, liberal society, I suppose. And I think in that situ- in that context, this of a great revolution establishing some sort of new society and re- political regime, a revisionist like John Morrill, if I can, can you know take his name in vain, that <laughs> he would he would couple Hill's sort of Marxist progressivism, if you like. Um, with the sort of liberal, we always call it the Whig progressivism. So the people who thought it was a liberal, for the revisionists, they were saying it's a very, well, you know, that it's a much less significant conflict. It's an accidental conflict. The ideological divisions aren't that, you know, not necessarily inevitably leading to war. You can't discern a sort of materialist interpretation. So that was the sort of revisionism that my 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 PhD in my first book was sort of arguing against that because I was a part of revisionism, and again, this is very simple: was that most people were only concerned with their locality and their you know bread and butter issues in their backyard. And my study of Warwickshire tried to argue that people were engaged with national issues. There was an interplay between that. But the world turned upside down. It's a very, it's a sort of it's it's a very different sort of book. Um, it's about the people who, in Hill's terms, it's a very nineteen sixties book. Base um, the and other people have perhaps said this to you. It's influenced by people like Marcuse, feminism, radical politics of of the sixties and early seventies. About the people who were not bourgeois, who did not want private, well, did not necessarily want private property. They challenged notions of humanity. They challenged gender roles, perhaps. So it's what, um, and I worked with, I worked with Hill in the Open University. And, you know, it's what, it's, it's sort of like Edward Thompson was doing rescuing the people who are regarded as just eccentrics and lunatics. And the crucial, the, the crucial, I suppose, difference is where the levelers sit. Because in the world turned upside down, the levelers are the sort of compromising petty bourgeoisie, I suppose, whereas in the sort of bourgeois revolution framework, they're the sort of allies on the left pushing the revolution forward. So, so it's a very, very interesting book. 
And it is, as, as, as you've implied, incredibly creative. And, and there's, it's based on an incredibly um, voracious knowledge of the printed literature, of everything, of, of lit literary literature. You know, he did great work on Milton, of people who saw other possibilities and were defeated, but that their ideas remain important. Um, and on a on a notion that these radical ideas were mostly the developed within the sort of non elite groups, non elite collectivities, soldiers, um, people living in forests, masterless men, and so on. So it's a very very influential book in the nineteen seventies. Um, and it was a TV, you know, subject of radio programs. It was put, parts of it were put on at the National Theatre. And it is very, very influential, or was very, very influential, and then wasn't, and then isn't again. And then perhaps is again, sorry, because I'm old enough. They had a 40th anniversary conference of it. <laughs> where I, well, in fact, I did speak on both of them, though I shouldn't have really. But so in 2014, there, um, there was a conference in Sheffield where, to be honest, I, I, I have some problems with it. I think it's not terribly coherent. It's each bit is interesting. And I'm, and I'm not sure about, you know, there was a lot of radical speculation, which was by actually quite privileged people. And, you know, there's a sort of social, but anyway. But in 2014, the literature, literary scholars loved it. And the <laughs> historians were more or less, I mean, John Morrill was there, was very critical, but I mean, in very ways I wouldn't approve of or would, wouldn't agree with. But <clears throat> I, a lot of historians don't think it's his best book. The, you know the, um, but the fiftieth year, the fiftieth anniversary this year, interestingly, um, was much more, um, much more sympathetic to it. So I think it's generated a lot of interest in looking at all sorts of radical speculation. Um, but it's a, it's an interesting book within Hill's overall framework of how he understood the revolution and all and all the other things you know his interest in Milton and so on um and it it's not quite a it's not a bourgeois revolution book so I think it's interesting yeah that's that's wonderful I think you know you've expressed concerns a couple of times about covering stuff we've already covered I wouldn't worry about that I also wouldn't worry especially at the beginning about being too simple. In other words, what I'm about to do is going to seem to you even simpler. So if you, yeah, okay. if you're sitting here and you're not thinking about, um, if it's been a while since you've studied your Marxist history of revolution, yeah. the, 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 the theory goes that all revolutions are, are class revolutions and essentially the, the top class will fall to the next rising class. That's what, that's what Anne is referring to. So the idea is if you've got a king and and lots of aristocrats, the people who are going to be revolting are not the peasants. It's the rising bourgeois capitalist class. And the peasant revolution still, as far as I know, still hasn't occurred in the standard uh, Marxist theory. We're, we're, we're still England, waiting on that anyway. one. Yeah, not in um, so what you're saying is, since Hill is one of these famous you know, British Marxists, along with Thompson and Hobsbawm, he's apparently, and I, I, I saw this in the book, not a not a standard Marxist, because the standard Marxist should say this was that revolution we were waiting for, where the bourgeois capitalists mm. took down the aristocracy, yeah. and the next one is coming later. And if you're focusing on <laughs> Win Stanley mm. and the diggers and people like that, then you are not, you have yeah. not found your perfect Marxist bourgeois revolution. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. What, what I would say, and it's worth, um, there's a collection of um, documents edited by David Parker that people might want to look at. What what I find more interest, well, as interesting as the world turned upside down, is a collection of essays that was published in, I think, well, in the early 60s, was written in the, called Puritanism and Revolution. So Hill wrote, studied and wrote the chapters in that while he was a paid up 
loyal, loyalish member of the British Communist Party. And that includes the Mad Hatter, who was a vegetarian, I think, and a sort of event. And it includes all, as well as some literary things, it includes all sorts of non, you know, formalistic class warfare sort of Marxism. And it was, there was a Communist Party historians group in the 1940s and 50s, which was a genuine mixture of, you know, working class autodidacts and Oxford, histo- you know, well, and historians from elsewhere. And they, they were not blindly following a sort of pattern such as you, and they had all sorts of differences about, you know, whether actually capitalism was already emerging and it emerged in Tudor times so that, you know, and about what the how rigid you have to be about the class formations. And so I think, I think Hill has never, was never so rigid that it had to be all very neatly sort of connected up. And I do think, and I think I, I'm not a Marxist, I don't know if I ever was, but I think I am a materialist. And I think now, again, it's not everybody, but rather than thinking about what caused the upheavals um, in, in a very mechanical way, the cause civil war and their revolution, is to think about how was it that in England in the 1640s, unlike, say, in Spain or France, where there were revolts, um, and there will be parallels in certainly in the Netherlands, how was it that the, the, the a thing that began at least in part about modifying the government, rescuing the king from evil counsellors, getting the goodies in there, you know, reversing changes in the church that people didn't like. How come that did end up in radical action and radical speculation about the you know, the foundations of political power? It ended up where enough people were willing to, you know, publicly try and execute the king. It ended up with very widespread, really, religious toleration. And there are, it seems to me, there's all sorts of things about English social structure the role of the middling sort, these sort of independent people. The notion had been a century of social change, which also created all sorts of anxieties and problems and tensions at all social levels. Um, and that people were getting more literate, that print was important, that collective action locally linked in with visions of how you should organise. So, so and, and I think, but just the, that it's not accidental. People aren't naturally conservative. They're not naturally localist. Depends on their context and their collective discussions and actions. I think that, I think that Hill has given people and a sort of generosity of vision about what sorts of people you're interested in, what sorts of ideas you're interested in. The, the sort of, Big sort of uh, Mike Braddock is about to publish an intellectual biography of Hill, and he's a sort of, I suppose he's a post revisionist, Mike. But the th- the thing that is sort of odd about Hill's work, of course, is that he was never a proper economic historian, and you know I'm sure perhaps Jan Morris said, and he and he worked, and you could not write the world turned upside down if you looked at every obscure manuscript. You know, you see, he was working on pamphlet literature. He was working on on you know published writings. So there's a sort of it doesn't necessarily fit in with with the very rich social history that has been produced by scholars. Um, but you can link a lot of that social history to a, a capacious view of what happens in and what's made possible once war breaks out in the 1640s and 1650s. Yeah, that's great. I But before we get to the main thrust of the book, I just want to follow up on one thing in terms of talking about it as a book of, of the 60s. And this does keep us sort of in the realm of historiography. One of the things, I, I think it was Ariel in our initial conversation, you know, he was concerned about this problem of anachronism, which many, many um, historians are. I myself do not yeah, no, fear anachronism because that suggests yeah, that no, no. you... Yeah, yeah, and Hill yeah. 
has lines like the counterculture and the Puritan sexual revolution. Yeah, he yeah. clearly does not fear uh, anachronism. Yeah. And I'm, I'm all for it. A sexual revolution is a sexual revolution, whether they used those terms or not. So I just thought we could get into the book through this. He's clearly seeing writing from the sixties. He's yeah. writing a sixties inflected history. And that's, Oh, yeah. I know no, there's exactly. historians who would think that's scandalous, but he clearly was not scandalized because he was doing it. No, I don't. I don't. Yes, I don't think it's scandalous or scandal. But I think, well, I think it works in both directions, doesn't it? I think it matters. <laughs> um, it, it's <sighs> there's an issue. I mean, Win Stanley is a very good example here, actually, because I could use. I mean, again, it would be anachronistic. He. Uh, in a way, but he's in Win Stanley's encounter with the Ranters. He says, "Well, you know, a, he, I mean, Win Stanley was, you know, I think, you know, a very puritanical in the sort of, you, you know, he wasn't, he was a very serious, you know, chap." Um, and he, but he says something like, "Oh, you know, these ranting people, it'll be women who suffer. They'll be with child, and they'll go." So I think, I think there's a, a sort of optimism about. Uh, certainly, there's an optimism about gender equality and all that and how it works in um in the world turned upside down which you could um which you could counter from 17th century stuff you could you could argue you know from a from a sort of argument about the 60s actually where i think it was probably quite you know i'm almost a bit yeah i'm almost too young but i'm not actually too but you know there's a the whole thing about about the, those sort of left-wing radical movements, which were a bit like, the, you know, they were privileging male sexual freedom more than female. So I think, um, and I think it's, I think history, I, I don't mind people using the 17th century to think with about their current issues. I, I do quite a lot of it. Um, and or or being interested in aspects because of what's going on in, um, you know, in your own life and situation. I just sometimes think it's it's very often too simple stories we tell and actually the nuanced, complicated stories and the sort of limits of the possibilities um, I think may, may be as helpful to you in your 21st or 20th century dilemmas. But certainly... Certainly, history in service of the pre present, I think, is it's hard to avoid. It ha does have its dangers, but I, d I don't think Hill. I don't think Hill was a blindly. He wasn't. He wasn't ransacking the past for very, very direct pre present purposes. I think he was. I think he was op over optimistic about. Um, so you know that that radical religion was also popular religion I think it probably wasn't or it wasn't entirely you know, it could be but most people like probably you know were quite happy with the you know the rhythms of the year of sort of traditional religion for instance you know people have made that argument against some of it but it's yes no that's great be. so we're, we're we're getting in so I was going to ask you you know just what is the the main argument of the book, what does he mean when he says the world turned upside down? Although I've already noticed a couple of things is one that you're saying that um, maybe the book doesn't have that clear of a, of a main I argument. I find it very hard to see it as an argument, actually. I don't know. I'm always, and I've, you know, I read it every 10 years if there's a conference, but I, I think, it, I think it's, um, there's, you know, it's very. You you find all sorts of things that you'd like to know more about, um, and say Ariel's work, which is very archivally based, um, and he may, have, you know, he can talk about that for himself, you know. But but that it, it, if you printed a pamphlet, Hill will know about you, would know about you. Um, if you were sort of very active in your parish, you know, being troublesome and, you know, moving house, and you know, Ariel, Ariel knows a lot more about almost everyone, well, everyone that he's interested in the world. And so it's very, um, it's a, it's, it's a 
very rich book for inspiring other people to do more. But it's, it's, I'd say two things. It's not, I don't think it is coherent. It's a work of sort of reclamation and saying there's more to it than constitutional change or, um, you know, political experiment. There's a whole lot of things that become up for grabs, which is true. Absolutely is true. It, it disappears or does it disappear? You know, it certainly, you know, people perhaps pick up the, it's hard to find, connect. you can find some connections. And there's some interesting things about um, people who who have traced, uh, you know, archivally in, in sort of particular areas that there are connections between Lollards and later radicals. But Hill sort of posited that there were really. I mean, he didn't. He didn't demonstrate it. Um, and I think um, there'd be a different. The sort of view. A lot of the social history is more. It's not quite the the bourgeois revolution, but it's about growing inequality and you know and and serious struggles against them that you can find in legal records and so on. But that. Um, again, is not necessarily politically radical in the way that Hill thought. But I, th- I think it's a, he's a, he was a very generous and rich and informed scholar, and I think it's a very, it's a generative book of other, other studies. So I just want to make sure I've got this right. I mean, my, my reading throughout this whole series has been sort of like, here are these ideas expressed often beautifully that we think of uh, these these radical ideas, the ideas of the ranters and Win yeah. Stanley, especially, when, um, yeah. that we think of as not being around in the 17th century, and as a showcase for those ideas, the world turned upside down is brilliant. Yeah, but it sounds like you're suggesting Hill thought it was more than oh, we've got we've got the 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 Loyalists and the New Model Army and Cromwell and the Levellers. And also, actually, if you look closely, there's some other weird bits and bobs. Hill's saying, actually, there was a mass revolution. And when Stanley, in some ways, you know, oh, look at all the other digger settlements. When Stanley stands for a much broader swath of the population, is that right? And you're skeptical of this claim. I, is that- I, I, I actually don't think it's right. I think... Okay. I mean, I think... Um, there's a lot of um I think Win Stanley is really interesting and, and he's a wonderful writer. And the diggers are really really the whole collective, you know, let's you know meet together, break ground together, eat together, and the earth is a common treasury. I um was on a radio program with um Ken Loach about Win Stanley. And, you know, some friends, well, the political, you know, c- colleagues who'd never heard of Winston, they thought, oh, the earth is a common treasury. That's yeah. <laughs> a fantastic idea. Yeah. And there's there's a whole, there's a revisionist work on Win Stanley, which says he was pretty, you know, he wasn't poor. They weren't starving. And I think that is true, actually. But what that makes it really interesting, and what it is, what it was is, what, well, you know, I'm probably using old-fashioned phrases, it's prefigurative action. They, they weren't doing it because most of the diggers in Surrey were, they, they were suffering like everyone else. It was a terribly hard period for people. But they, they were householders. They were doing it because they had a vision of a better society and that if they did it peacefully so and collectively it would inspire everyone else to follow them and they also had this thing which again is very uh, is very 60s and 70s um and we've certainly well I'm I'm much older and disillusioned now, and that to have a transformation <laughs> of society you have to be transformed as an individual you know yeah. your your whole being and uh, would be, and they expressed it in religious terms. And I think there's two things about the sort of hill position. One, he did he 
and it's unusual because he does he did have a very real understanding of religion but he does sometimes say you know religion was a sort of cloak for and and I don't think that the people were religious and that's how they it's not that it was a, and it was clearly a biblically inspired you know that the, the the fall of man had corrupted people but it had also corrupted the earth and that's why you know environmentalists are attracted you know that by buying and selling and making profit out of the land the land had been laid waste and people were also corrupted. So that's a wonderful image. And it's not, it doesn't have to be a mass movement to be inspiring. And I think it wasn't a mass movement. And I think where I think, I think that I think the I think the marginalizing of the levelers in the world turned upside down is also a problem. Um, because the levelers they were, you know, they denied any. They they were men and mostly of small property. They wanted, they certainly wanted a fairer society, but they didn't want to get rid of buying and selling in um in Winstaysen. The levellers in 1649 are a real threat. Um, the last time I've been talking, you know, about the modern thing, it was in Oxfordshire just um, well, just last week about the mutinies, the army mutinies. And the sort of divisions, if you like, in the sort of radical people who bought, brought the king to supported the trial of the king, that is a serious threat. And when the diggers meet, when, when Fairfax meets the diggers, the, when the army commander meets the diggers and has his you know conversation, he is coming back from having slaughtered or the leveller mutineers and, you know, shot the ones at Burford and, you know, let the others, that Winstanley is not seen as a threat by the authorities. He's seen as a great nuisance by the people whose land he's <laughs> interfering with. But he's either seen as, you know, just an eccentric um, or when they say, oh, well, he's, a, you know, anxieties about private property. So I, I don't... I think the notion that um, that the, the most radical ideas in a society like early modern England are to be found amongst the poor and the downtrodden, and that the poor and the downtrodden will find them attractive, I think that's misleading. And I don't think that sort of um, wishful thinking is helpful actually politically you know i don't think it's so so i don't think um they some people thought winston was just a, you know it was a joke or an eccentric um but i don't think i think a lot of it is is to misunderstand but the prose is so wonderful and the ideas of it are so wonderful that that's and that should be stressed and that um but I, it's not if you, in 1649, um, he's he's not a challenge to the regime. People don't, you know, the the local gentry don't like, you know, and and local people don't, you know, they don't want people talking about getting rid of private property. Certainly not. And a lot of people like the levellers want more done about poverty and inequality. Um, but they don't. Um, so that would be what I would think. I think it's, and I'm not sure if Hill did think it, but he didn't take he didn't take Win Stanley's religion mm. quite as seriously as he should have uh, done, and he didn't like. Um, the, I mean, a friend, the, the historian Mark Kishlansky, who who was a very aggressive sort of revisionist, and wrote. A, a lively penguin history. He said, oh, um, when Stanley be began life as a moderately prosperous corn um, cloth merchant and ended life as a, you know, moderately prosperous 
um, corn chandler, corn, you know, seller, <laughs> and in between had the larger, you know, the biggest midlife crisis in history. <laughs> and that that's to belittle it. And I was very fond of yeah. Mark Ushansky, but I don't agree. You know, that's a that's a clever right wing man saying something that's belittling. But biographically, it's not untrue. But it, but again, I think you know what what do you do in the 1660s when it's all gone horribly wrong? You make a living, don't you? you become a Quaker and you make a living. So I, I just think people sometimes, you know, you have to have everything fitting before you admire somebody, and I don't think that's correct. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. I mean, a couple, just a couple of quick notes before we move on. When you talk about when Stanley doing prefigurative work, prefigurative work, and also when you're talking about, you know, needing to needing to change one's heart. Uh, yeah, no, but I both think, of these are strong trends in anarchism. Oh, no, now, I'm all sure. the anarchists I, agree with absolutely. him, but I, yeah. yes, no, no, I think that's absolutely right. And I think, and he says something, you know, I he rejected violence, yeah, you know, overtly rejected violence. And again, that would be would would suit, you know, so, but I think it's try. There's often a said that. You you want to admire people completely, or you mm-hmm. don't? Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's the sort of way that you need sort of nuance and and understanding yeah, I mean, people. But yeah, no, I that that's, that doesn't. Um, and I, you see, I think the people, the the historian in particular, did a lot of really you know interesting work tracing Win Stanley to prove you know to say oh you know they weren't poor. He thought that that sort of devalued it, and it makes it just makes it different. You see, I think they think most of them had homes to go to, and most of us have homes. You know, people on the streets, you know, often do have homes to go to. It doesn't devalue their, you know, whatever they're doing on the streets. So I think, but so I think it's that it's how you argue against a historic, you know, a, hist- a historiography that was intended to belittle its significance. Why you say, oh, it's not quite as we would like to say that it should be, and should take from it what is relevant and, and inspire. No, I think I think it's gen, it's absolutely genuinely inspiring. Yeah, me, yeah, uh, of course. When Stanley, I found I find him absolutely yeah, no, inspiring, think, and yeah, the writing of that is what is, yeah. yeah. And it's, you know, I mean, listeners have heard me say this, but it's it's insofar as you can anachronistically call something anarchism before the 19th century it it slots in as well with the views of Kropotkin and someone like that as as anyone does yeah no I think it I think it's anarch- yeah it's um it's a sort of peaceful direct action yeah that you have I, I think Hill entire... I think Hill calls it anarchy but he's he's yes, quite willing but... to write anachronistically so that yes, makes sense yes no no I think yes yeah absolutely yeah no I think it's anything wrong with that so I guess briefly before we before we move on, I do want to throw out, I mean, this is sort of where I started, but I maybe I didn't ever quite ask you to weigh in on this. Is there a sense that the English Revolution is born with this book historiographically and it's just the just the Civil War before? Or is that it's just that he's yeah. altering it to be this uh, more widespread, less bourgeois revolution? No, you see, because it's also been a Puritan revolution. Um. And Lawrence Stone, who was not a Marxist, but was a sort of, I guess, a sort of liberal, he wrote um, when I, well, I do, that would be the 60s, I think, or the, uh, the causes of the English Revolution. It, it's it's tied up, with, and then people started calling it the Great Rebellion. That's the sort of revision, it's <laughs> in the Great Rebellion. But, yeah. um, that it's, I think it was, it's also, um, and I think it's, uh, I don't think it's a very useful notion anymore, but there was the revisionists also didn't want to see it as a progressive, you know, there's a liberal, there's a liberal tradition that it's a progressive movement. And there's a Marxist tradition that also it's a necessary, nasty, but ultimately progressive movement. And so there's been a whole lot of historiography, revisionist historiography won't say, well, you know, it's you can't see any, which side is modern or progressive is 
you know, he's not then probably perhaps perhaps it was the king, you know, modernizing the monarchy, making it more efficient and religious check, you know, perhaps the king was the religious innovator. So it's, you know, the Puritans are defending people against what they see is going, you know, becoming more ritualistic, perhaps more Catholic. I don't think that's as I say, I think it happened in a period of very significant social and economic change where people are finding different ways of coping with that and and which is a sort of context. It's not necessarily determining what they were. But um, so, no, I think Hill, I suppose Hill encouraged um, people to think about the revolutionary that and and I think this is true it's clearly true that you know the 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 people who um carried out at the sort of top if you like of the parliamentary army or the surviving members who carried out the most obvious revolution which is the execution of the king and the creation of a republic which is is also quite useful to remind people of um that they had there was a broad a much broader movement which was more socially diverse and was of, often much more radical um about say religious liberty or legal the law reform law reform or you know power of great merchant companies and so on um but i think most there's a lot of interest now in the levelers in the radical movements in Parliament's army. I don't, I don't know if anyone recommended to you an American called David Como, who's written no. a book called Radical. He's at Stanford, who um, has written a, a book about a book about radical parliamentarianism and is about to, you know, which goes up to 45, 1645, and then he's going to do one that takes it through. And he he does see um, he is influenced by Hill, I think, in terms of seeing it very much uh, um, zealous parliamentarianism being very much inspired by radical religious ideas, particularly challenging to a sort of formalistic Calvinism. And so a spiritual, well, the term is often antinomianism, people who didn't thought you could just, you know, the, the idea was a spiritual identification with Christ that sort of liberated you. And so he would see that as a very important, so he's very interested in someone like William Walwyn and um, army, various army preachers. And, and that's, and that the, and that it's radical, it's radical people, particularly in London, but then in the army as well, who pushed, forward the measures that are necessary to fight a civil war um so and there's something in that may not be the only fact so uh, but it's not um and he's interested in sort of collective action politics of the street game to clean and politics of garrisons you see the the army the sort of citizen army as a sort of collectivity and the thing I'm trying to think when the Portuguese when the Portuguese threw out their their dictator, which was probably the same, you know, that was a sort of that that was a lot of army, a radical a radical anti-colonial army revolt, which is quite interesting, you know, and this notion of a citizen army, which is there is there is that's in Welton Upside Down as well. But I think I think that would be where people are talking about radicalism and and when stanley would be part when stanley david thinks was in touch with some of that but i think in his writings and in his action he's but he's not an activist in the same way that um, other people are organizing in, right they're organizing partly in traditional you know their their wards their um in the city, their um, livery companies and so their army. You've never been a soldier, which is quite unusual. Um, for yeah, that again. I mean, again, you're just pulling right into some of the some of the threads of 
of mm. how should the anarchists organize and yeah. it's 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 yes. it's fantastic Cause, stuff. Because yeah. Walwyn, Walwyn has this great falling out and uh, with because with people, there's a big split where where people who think what's happened in the execution of the king is enough, and particularly people and again it is and hill is probably i mean hill hill would be one of the ones who inspired this the, the people who really wanted religious liberty and that was it. they they mostly and they turn on the levelers and 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 warwin says something you know i'm sorry to have you know that this man is now viciously attacking you know i first met him in my company and my ward in the city but you know mm. they they've worked together in a radical way but within existing political institutions. The army is a new form of politics. Yep. Um, but it wouldn't be for everybody. But Win <laughs> Stanley is doing something rather different. Yeah, no, that make that makes perfect sense. I think I think and we've covered everything except for my question about Hobbes bomb and the and the beginning yes. of modernity. Do you yeah. want to do you yes, want to take I that do. one on? I, I want to say <laughs> um Actually, let me hold on. Let me just say for the for the listeners who haven't yeah, heard the question. So, the question. Yeah. you know, if you um, if you read histories of the modern world, pretty much everyone will claim that the modern world begins in 1789. The most famous expression of this, at least in the English speaking world, is in Hobsbawm's book. But what century of you know, revolution? What, what's it called? Yeah, Revol- Age of Revolution. Age I think. of Revolution. Yes, 1789 century of Revolution is of Hill. Yes. Whatever. Yeah. Yes. And uh, I don't know if maybe if, and then all the other world revolutions come. Maybe this is the first one, though. Is the question that I'm that I I'm think, putting I to you? Think it, I think it depends what you mean, obviously, by modernity. And it may be a sort of Eurocentric thing, and it's a sort of often a progressive thing. But I think I you've um, I think you said you've had a session on Hobbes. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, I think I was going to say, and I think David Como's as well, paradox, I think what happens, I think what happens in the 1640s and 50s, and I suppose paradoxically has, and not in a very nice way in many ways, you know, it it's very much modernises the English state. Uh, and... Co- David Como's line would be that it's these radical liberationists who actually, because they want Parliament to win the Civil War, they play as big a part as anyone in establishing a very extractive, powerful state. Taxation goes enormously high, officials rather than local people, colonisation in the Caribbean and in Ireland. So I think if you think about um, things that, are not they're not you know it's not necessarily nice modernity um but in terms of notions of religious liberty notions in hobbes and radicals that politics is of human construction you know a science of politics developments of science but also developments about english state formation which are not usually put for they're usually centered on the 1690s and 60s and I would say um, what we see as modern depends on what you mean, <laughs> and it's very usually very Eurocentric. Um, but I think if you if you think about very very significant change, the 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 fighting of a civil war and the winning of a civil war, where you do rally the mass of the population in a way that is usually, again, associated with French revolutionary wars. Uh, there's, you know, a very significant amount, number of the population was, milit- you know, in the military, men. No one will have been the way in which the state extracted labour, taxation um, from the population. Um, but also the breakdown of united or, you know, effective religious, you know, disciplines, um, different notions of politics, different ways in which notions of human agency. I think it's, I wouldn't start, you know, we have early modernity, whatever (laughs) that is. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, and I don't, and I do think, and I think he'll, 
you know, Hill has written about, wrote about the history, you know, history of science. I just think in the, um, I think there's a there's a richness to some of the conceptions that Hill is in about what what change was encompassed and the limits on it. But I mean, that's you know that that applies to the nineteenth century as well. So I would certainly see what happens in England. There may be I don't know if the Dutch revolt against the Spanish has some of the. The print, the pop, the pop, you know, religious free, you know, the, the the involvement of the population, but I think England is a, and and the colonial, you know, it's very it's very radical to be against. Very few people were against English colonial enterprise, slavery. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm apt to see this concept of modernity developing in Europe as a pretty Eurocentric and frankly, you know, I mean, can, we can, we can find, we can find the revolution that created modernity in, in China 2000 years ago. If we, if we yeah, want, I think yeah, we can find yeah. a lot of those yeah, same yeah. things. Yeah, no, no, I think, yes, no, I think, so I don't see why, I mean, it is, um, I've once did, well, not once, not very long ago, but just before COVID, well, when COVID was starting, we, I, I did a small sort of workshop thing about um, can you compare the English and the American civil wars? And and there is, there is a scale of sort of devastation and um, mobilisation and then devastation that, that actually, you know, is not found quite in England, and there's a sort of resilience in English society, which is quite interesting and is um, probably expl- explicable in terms of early capitalism or something, you know. But um, so there are obvious changes. But no, yeah. I think um, the Age of Revolution, you know, it's a it's a textbook sort of. <laughs> 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 I think I've taught yeah. from that text from those Hobsbawm books that I couldn't. I don't think they're as rich in their imagination or their scope as yeah. It's the work myself. It's the answer on the them. quiz. When did modernity start? Seventeen eighty nine. No, I don't. Not. Yeah. I wouldn't think. Well, <laughs> seven, yeah, but um, you can see because it's also interesting. I mean, it's obviously well known in the American Revolution context, but people like Harrington and Locke. Um, so the political theories and some of that are really influential on the French, the first, you know, certainly the early um, stages of the French Revolution, as they are in, in you know, the founding fathers in, um, in America. So it has, it has, it's seen often by people in those revolutions as where they come from. Right. And the yeah, French... And- get, the French are actually more, in a, in a way, more interesting, aren't they, than that? Because you know the, the the Americans, that's where they had come from, you know. But so, and and had read read that, you know, they'd certainly read Harrington, they'd read Locke, they'd read some Levelist stuff, probably. Okay, um, I think that's everything for me. Is there anything else hey, you I would like to I, add or share? No, no. I think I've said everything. I I hope I haven't disappointed you on my um, scepticism about the world turned upside down. No, um, no, this was, I mean, this was delightful. I guess I will, I will just say to the listeners, I think, you know, without being an expert, I think Anne's reservations about this book as a sort of grand narrative are fair. Uh, It's, I can't imagine, I certainly failed to like read it you know, from page one to page 200, it's not a page turner, but the, the narratives of these different pockets yeah. of radicalism yeah. and the way he relates science and magic and, yeah. you know, atheism yeah, yeah. and with Stanley there, it's fascinating. It's, it's yeah. such a pleasure each, to read. Each chapter is worth reading. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Anyway, thank you and, very much, Graham. And yes, I'll, thank you. Thank you yeah. for taking the time. I'm glad we managed to make it happen. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you very much. So do we.